Hey, what's up? It's Ben Greenfield. Today's podcast guest is, I think, a four-timer, possibly even a five-timer. He's been on the show a lot. We always have a lot of fun when we chat. His name's Craig Dinkle. So you're going to love what we talk about today. He's training for this crazy hike, uh, actually the hardest hike in all of America. And he's sharing all of his training secrets with us today. We talk nutrition, everything. So uh, before we jump in, there is something very popular that is now officially uh, available again. It's called Keon Lean. For a long time, this stuff, which is my go-to fat loss and blood sugar control supplement, has been sold out over at Keon because it's so effective. I mean, I've tested my blood sugar after I use this stuff, and it drops my blood sugar lower than the diabetic drug metformin. Uh, Since I like to have a drink every night, it also helps that it has rock lotus in it, which not only assists with improving liver function, but also regular glucose metabolism. The primary ingredient in this stuff, those bitter melon extract. If you ever heard me speak from stage about the number one way to enhance longevity, it's to lower glycemic variability. And this stuff lowers that blood glucose response like crazy. So that's all. Those are the two ingredients, bitter melon extract, rock lotus extract. Uh, You can also take it before a sauna to enhance the effects of a sauna and the formation of heat shock proteins. You can take it before cold thermogenesis to enhance the conversion of white fat to brown fat. So many things going for this stuff. So it's called Key on Lean. Just got back into stock. Uh, Start shipping August 10th. So you go to getkeon.com, get K-I-O-N.com, and this stuff is called Key on Lean. This podcast is uh, also brought to you by another interesting supplement. I want to discuss omega-3s for a second. Uh, There is this company that has what they claim is the purest omega-3 supplement on the market. So I do a lot of homework when somebody comes to me and says something like that. So I tried some of this stuff out. And not only do you get zero fish burps from it, but uh, they have a freezer test challenge. Basically, if you freeze most other omega-3 supplements, they get cloudy. That's all the filler. But the Omax-3 soft gel, they call it the soft gel, it stays totally clear. It's that pure. Uh, Zero fish burps as well, did I mention. So it's almost 94% pure omega-3 fatty acids. They've got a EPA to DHA ratio of 4 to 1, which is very similar to what you'd find in a big old filet of wild-caught fish. They specifically engineered this stuff to manage inflammation and to manage joint pain, and you get a box for free. That's right, for nothing. So the way that you get a free box of Omax is you go to tryomax.com slash Ben. That's tryomax.com slash Ben. Gives you a free box of Omax 3. Comes with a 60-day money-back guarantee. So you have a lot of time to try this out and to see whether it works for you. If it doesn't, just package all that non-cloudy fish oil up and send it back. Tryomax.com slash Ben for a free box. Some terms and conditions apply. Hopefully not to you, but go over there to get your free box. Tryomax.com slash Ben. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there when you look at all the studies done studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place, right here, right now, on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Hey folks, what's up? It's Ben Greenfield and... uh... I'm flying high this morning. I actually have been switching up my breakfasts of late. Actually, I'm curious. I want to hear what today's podcast guest had today for breakfast because he's training for this crazy Sierra high route solo in August. It's like this off-grid 200-mile hike at altitude, 9,000 to 12,000 feet altitude. So I'm, I'm curious, and we're going to dig into how he's training and how he's eating for that. But here's here's my switch up for breakfast. Uh, and you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna say hello to you, Craig, first before I just start to talk about my breakfast while ignoring you. 
<laughs> no. Hey, it's uh, hello. It's great to talk to you again, and I'm dying to hear about your breakfast. Okay, might help my breakfast. Uh, yeah, it actually included. My, so my breakfast did include some things that you you introduced me to, but then it's also it's kind of changed up because I'm I'm of course uh, uh, halfway like f list celebrity famous for my my <laughs> crazy big ass smoothies. Uh, of late, I think was the one that I described on the on the Joe Rogan show, which was the Wendy's Frosty Smoothie, where I would take a whole bunch of bone broth and blend that up with ice and a little bit of lemon, which enhances the collagen absorption from the broth, then some stevia and a little bit of protein powder, and that's like the base. There's a bunch of little superfoods that go in there, but the trick is that you blend it for like four or five minutes, and as you blend it for four or five minutes. It introduces a little bit of air, a little bit of creaminess, and a little bit of frostiness to the to the recipe. But what I've been doing of late is simply, uh, due to the fact I've been super busy in the mornings, especially, and I've been consuming my breakfast while I'm while I'm working, even while I'm podcasting, I have a little bit of breakfast left here right in front of me. So I've been taking bone broth. Uh, I've been using this uh, this kettle and fire bone broth, and uh, I've I've interviewed these folks in the past. They do like organic packaged bone broth, and what I do is I heat it up over the stove top, and then I blend it with just a whole bunch of different super nutrients. So this morning into the bone broth, I put a couple teaspoons of maca root, a teaspoon of this uh, this black ant extract stuff, which is incredibly high in zinc. Uh, a little bit of vanilla stevia, and then uh, I, I actually broke open seven capsules of this this Qualia Mind Nootropic, and I I dropped all of that in there, and then I also <clears throat> and I want to hear what your thoughts are on this. I broke open three capsules of AFA, three capsules of the Oxia and three capsules of your chlorella. I'd put all of those in there in celebration of the fact that I would be interviewing you. I blended that all for about <laughs> two minutes on high, and I sucked that down for breakfast. And I got to tell you, man, man I'm, I'm flying high. And it tasted, sounds like a witch's brew, man. It, it tasted great. really good. It tasted really yeah, good. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put the recipe in the show notes for everybody listening in. It's at uh, bengreenfieldfitness.com slash cleanup, because we're going to be talking about... Uh, among other things today, how to how to clean up the the hidden ingredients in your supplements. But uh, BenGreenfieldFitness dot com slash cleanup. I'll put that whole recipe. But in the meantime, Craig, what was your brew of choice today, if anything? Oh, man, you know, I've I've had a recent event. I started to have a blood sugar issue, so I have to start managing my my carbohydrate intake uh, much more carefully than I've had to in the past. I've been a you know a huge carbohydrate guy. I mean, I like, I like, uh, I like bread. I like toast. I like jam, stuff like that in the morning with a lot of protein. But these days I have to keep sort of an eye on this thing and navigate the world through more protein than carbohydrates, which makes this trip that I'm going to be doing very interesting. Cause I'm going to be hiking. I'm going to be walking and hiking off route for about in, in rough terrain. And, uh, you know, it's, hopefully I'll be doing about 7,000 vertical a day, but not less than let's say 5,000 vertical a day. I'm very, very curious to see how my metabolism works with uh, you know with blood t- sugar because I have to eat a, eat a lot of carbohydrate up there um, and I'll get a little less protein up there to drive me and so I'm curious to see how my blood sugar works but that's a long roundabout way to get to the answer to your question these days what I do for breakfast is pretty simple stuff it's it's gonna be like four over easy eggs or it's gonna be uh, this is gonna sound strange but I I like omelets but I don't like like a heavy egg omelet so I'll make two um, I'll make two two egg omelets with a bunch of cheese, some avocado and some uh, chicken or protein in there that I can handle. So I do that two times because I like the thinner egg omelet over then, you know, eggs tend to thicken up when you make them in an omelet. And I know that sounds a bit, uh, a bit off, uh, a, a bit off course here, but that's how I like to eat my eggs. Interesting. So, so are you concerned at all? And have you looked into this at all about the fact that when you're trying to regulate blood sugar, you can experience blood sugar swings and high blood sugar, even with too much protein? I mean, the classic case would be the you know, the guy, Sean Baker, who's the champion right now of the, the carnivore diet. He revealed his, his blood labs. He published them on his website. And he's like borderline type 2 diabetic. He, granted, he's eating like, I think, four to six pounds of meat per day. But wow. his his blood sugar levels are through the freaking roof because it could because of the you know the gluconeogenic effects of protein when you're trying to control blood sugar versus say doing more vegetables and monounsaturated fats, smaller amounts of saturated fats, that type oh. of approach. 
That's really interesting. I, you know, I feel bad for that guy because I don't have that problem. I find that anytime I just uh, maintain the exercise I do and I train pretty hard, I guess we're going to get into that, but um, I don't always train hard, but when I'm training for an event, I do train event specific and grueling. We've, we've talked a little bit about that in the past, but I find that when I just get really disciplined, here's my problem. I get really disciplined. I do a paleo like diet, a uh, high protein, very low carbohydrate, high fat, and my blood sugar lines right up. The problem is, is that the consequences of that for me are hunger. I'm always hungry. Uh, and I've lost a lot of weight because of it. I used to weigh right in around 190, then in about 185. And right now I, 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 I hover right around 178, 180, which is, you know, it's a number from college days practically for me. But so I'm leaner than I've ever been. And I suppose that's a good thing. And I don't fit the profile for, uh, you know, for any sort of high blood sugar problem. But here it is. But no, great, great exercise, really good exercise and uh, mostly going heavy paleo puts my numbers right down into normal ranges. I mean, I can really get them back to normal. It's just hard. It takes a lot of discipline. And, um, you know, I'm hungry. So that's why I'm really curious about what's going to happen on the hike because I can't eat like that up there. I, I have to have oatmeal for breakfast. I have to have high carbohydrate meals for dinner. But I'm trusting and counting on the fact that uh, I'm going to be walking 10 hours a day. And, yeah, uh, it's it's, yeah. it's it's a speed bump. And, and a lot of people don't realize this, a lot, especially a lot of endurance athletes. And I know that at the time of this uh, recording, I was actually texting uh, Ian Adamson uh, the past couple of days about this because I'm interested in possibly getting involved on a team next year. Uh, Primal Quest and Eco Challenge and some of these big adventure races, they're becoming a thing again. You know, all these oh, it sounds uh, awesome. big, long seven-day adventure races I used to watch when I was a kid and I told him, you know, yeah. there's a chance for me to be on a team. I might, I might leap at something like that. But a lot of, uh, a lot of even these serious endurance folks don't realize that once you get into altitude, this was even interesting for me. And I found it when I was researching for beyond training, my last book about altitude training, I discovered that the body actually shifts into a higher amount of glucose and carbohydrate utilization at altitude. There's a direct correlation. So not only does your high level of physical activity dictate that the calories you're eating and the carbohydrates that you're eating are going to be a moot point when it comes to blood sugar regulation, but your body actually doesn't do as well with say ketosis or pure fatty acid utilization. The higher you get, the, the more you need to eat easy to digest carbohydrate sources. Right. So, so it's probably a little bit less of an issue for you at altitude, but I've still found, and uh, at the again at the time of this recording, uh, I will have already released my podcast with Sammy Inkinen, who runs Verta Health, and they manage you know, diabetic issues for a lot of people. I've also interviewed Dominique Diagosino before, and those guys are very much into macadamia nuts and also spirulina and chlorella, which I know is, is an ingredient in the supplements that you make, the chlorella is, but uh, the combination of the omega-3 fatty acids and the high nutrient density with low volume of algae, so it's, it's easy to transport, combined with the, the slow bleed of the high amount of saturated fats from the macadamia nuts is kind of like a really good one-two combo, and that's something I'll munch on. I'm actually flying to Estonia tomorrow. I have a, a ten and a half hour flight Seattle to Frankfurt first thing in the morning. And Do you ever stop moving? I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, Jesus no. Just, and and just, I'll <laughs> I'll get on the airplane with a bag. Uh, my bag's already packed upstairs. Macadamia nuts and these uh, these energy bits, which have like you know chlorella and spirulina and stuff in them. And I've also as, as soon as I get back, I go to race the at altitude in Mesa, Colorado, the train to hunt world championship. So I've got your oxia, your chlorella and your AFA, and I'm loading with those, you know, I, I load with those for at least two Great. weeks going into every one of my competitions. So I've got those packed in my bag, but macadamia nuts and, uh, the, these energy bits like that, like the chewable spirulina and chlorella tablets, that's what I'll tend to eat for long periods of time. But you also may want to use a strategy, you know, like throwing in some macadamia nuts to kind of stabilize the blood sugar and give you a slow bleed along with some of the more carbohydrate dense sources you'll have at altitude yeah, yeah it's a really good idea and uh, if i re if i remember correctly i got to look this up again but i think macadamia nuts are actually the best nut that i can eat for you know managing uh, for managing blood sugar as the nut as the nut group goes so that's definitely something that's going to be in my in my grab bag. I guess a lot of people like to make this stuff called gorp. You're probably familiar with it. It's M and M's, peanuts, candies, all this sort of stuff to. Well, they call to it give gorp. You. Yeah, that's an old term for it. Gorp. Can you believe that? I don't know what else it's like called. G O R P. But yeah. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's an ugly name. And what's but, in it? Uh, 
um, oh, they, they'll mix stuff up and it can have raisins. It can have de- dehydrated fruit. It'll have nuts of all kinds. M&Ms will be in there too. I never thought of it. It's really a great, you know, healthy energy source when you're up there in the mountains and, and, and climbing at altitude and going straight up and down and up all the time. But, you know, it's a lot of sugar, but I just think these days there are better ways to, uh, to fuel yourself. But, uh, so what you're talking about with macadamia nuts, I could do sort of a hybrid version of that, a hybrid, a, a newer hybrid version of GORP with macadamia nuts, maybe raisins isn't such a bad thing in the world and, and some other, some other nuts in there that will help, uh, move me along. Yeah, I would even consider, and this is something a lot of people don't think about when they consider blood sugar regulation, the fermentability of your of your choice of carbohydrate. For example, dried fruit is good because it's pretty nutrient dense for the volume and it doesn't have a lot of water weight to it for climbing, but it's also extremely fermentable, especially if people have like, you know, fructose malabsorption or FODMAP issues. So what I recommend a lot of times as, a, as an easy to digest carbohydrate source is something that's got like dextrin or a little bit of like a potato based starch. Um, one that I like is dried plantains. You can get these from like the bulk food section of a lot of grocery stores. You gotta, you gotta check to make sure they're not coated in canola oil. Cause a lot of them are, uh, there's, there's companies like thrive market online that will just sell you, you know, regular old organic plantain, but it's pretty light. And you can use that, you know, for example, you can have a, a bag with macadamia nuts with plantain or like a, like a potato based source, you know, dried sweet potato, dried yam. You can get this stuff, you know, again, like Thrive Market is a good place. Amazon has some of this as well. And you can mix it with, with the macadamia nuts and the algae. So instead of, of fermentable fruit, you've got a, an easier to digest, but still relatively dense. And also, you know, you could argue more ancestral kind of root based carbohydrate source along with the, you know, the huge amount of calories you get from the mac nuts and the saturated fats and the slow bleed of energy from the mac nuts and then the nutrients from the algae. Yeah, that sounds phenomenal. That sounds like a that sounds like a gorp I need to put together. Yeah, I love plantains too. I love plantains. So call it uh, call it uh, good good gorp. <laughs> yeah, and I guess another term. I guess the more common term for it is trail mix. I don't know where the term gorp came from. That's that's what I first heard, but it's also called trail mix. So any 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 combination of the things we just discussed uh, uh, that you just mentioned and I mentioned a minute ago would constitute trail mix or gorp. But uh, I like uh, what you described better. It sounds like a healthier fuel source. So that's something yeah. I'll, I think I'll build out. Yeah. I also you, have to resupply on this trip. I have to go in with about 15, 20 pounds of food. Um, and, and after about 100 and 120 miles, somewhere right in around there, I have to. I have a resupply coming in. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be having to resupply twice. How do they get you your resupply on these trips? Yeah. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the trail, it's not a trail. I, sh- I don't want to call it that because it's definitely not a look at the ground and walk. It's a look up at peak to peak. It's like a waypoint hike, if you will. So got to navigate from waypoint to waypoint, you know, looking up at peaks and figuring out how to get to the next waypoint. Nothing's a straight line. Most most of it's not a straight line. Most of it's, okay, there it is, you know, five miles out or three miles out. Now I got to figure out how to get there. So it's up and down and around and over. But at about a hundred and at about a hundred and a at about the 120 mile point, I'll go through a place called Red's Meadows. Uh, it's in the it's in the uh, Mammoth area, and uh, so I'll have a box waiting. I'll, I'll I'll forward a box here. Have my brother forward me a box when I'm about five days into the hike. It'll be sitting there waiting for me. I'll I'll show up there basically on vapor, you know, no fuel at all, uh, resupply, uh, and then get back out there. And speaking of resupply, this is a pain in the butt because a lot of this stuff has to. Uh, uh, be put into a bear canister because I'm going through bear country. Uh, fortunately, not brown bear country, just black bear country. But if you know the story, and a lot of people don't, uh, grizzly bear are bad news. We all know that. And a lot of people don't understand how bad news black bear are, the difference between them. And certainly no guarantees here. But you have probably a better chance of surviving a grizzly bear attack if you know how to behave with a grizzly bear than you do if a black bear decides to attack. But no what kidding. Because when a that's a fact. That's a hard, stone cold, ugly fact. If a black bear decides to attack, which they rarely do, that's the upside of being around black bears. That they just they just don't attack. But when they do, you have to fight for your life. They fight to kill. Grizzly bear, on the other hand, are ten times stronger. They're tanks. They're brutal. They're they're tough as hell, as you know. Story after story, you've heard about people getting mauled and surviving. Uh, because the old story of you play dead with a with a grizzly bear is true, and they tend to not always, but they tend to leave you alone and go away. Or maybe, and here's the worst part of it: if you do survive a grizzly bear attack, they, they, the worst thing that can happen is they'll after they think you're dead, they'll drag you off the trail, 
they'll cover you with sticks and branches and stuff, but they still tend to go away and then come back later to have their meal. And it's at that point, you just get up and go. And, you know, and I mean go. So uh, with a grizzly bear, in fact, you play dead. You do everything you can to not threaten it and play dead. And with a black bear, you fight for your life because like a polar bear, they're just going to kill you. Isn't that weird? Dang. That's interesting. I hope that black bears don't have a, 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 a taste for macadamia nuts and plantain <laughs> chips, or I may have just completely screwed you. Yeah, are, you um, are, yeah. are you doing... And actually, before I ask you this question, I should clarify. Those of you who do not know Craig, I just took for granted that you would know him because this is his fourth time on my show. I think if, it's the fifth. Is it the fifth? fifth? Dude. It's the fifth. I yeah. I'll put a link to all of Craig's past episodes on the on the show. But uh, in in a nutshell, 30-second overview, Craig is a, is a former extremely high-level competitive swimmer who shifted into climbing and altitude training and at the same time launched a nutrition supplement company called Biotropic that I discovered a few years ago. And I now use and load with his supplements before I go to races. It's kind of like beet juice on steroids. He's got chlorella and he's got echinacea and he's got uh, different forms of algae, different forms of liver extract, basically uh, everything that you'd need to legally dope your blood without actually using erythropoietin. When you combine his supplements with some of the, the, the proven ways that you can train for altitude, including like hypoxia training, of course, just going to altitude and training and even doing like, I do a lot of this high heat sauna training. Uh, which we've talked all about before in previous episodes, how to kind of biohack altitude training. Uh, it, it's incredibly potent. Like his stuff is a fantastic one-two combo for anybody who wants to boost the blood. And it also works really well for anything, anything for which you'd need like kind of a full body Viagra effect, including sex. Your supplements are good pre-sex as well. So <laughs> I've, a lot had, I've had people comment on that. I never bring it up, but it's true. Yeah, they're like boner pills, basically. Except they're again without the uh, without well, the, yeah. the Viagra well, and yeah. the prescription thrown in. But well, basically, uh, that that's the skinny on Craig. Is that a good thirty second overview, Craig? That's good. That's good. I yeah. I, I I did build these products around my own experience. You know, when when I was training for a couple of Olympic teams, um, so they were built with uh, blood development, blood oxygenation, and red blood cell development in mind. Uh, and so what you're just saying about what Ben's saying about the uh, well, let's say the ED effect is sort of a pleasant after effect, an unintended but good consequence of this product. I never had that in mind, but it did work out that yeah, way. Yeah, you just got to build in sound effects. You open up the capsule, and it'll give you a little boing, boing, boing. <laughs> Uh, anyways, though, so go go listen to Craig's previous shows if you want a deep, deep dive into the ingredients of his supplements and to his background. Just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash cleanup. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash cleanup because, again, we're going to talk in a little bit about some of the you know calcium carbonate and dicalcium phosphate and microcrystalline cellulose and some of these other things you might see in your supplements that we want to have a little conversation around because I wanted to ask Craig about this. I noticed he was he was starting to, to clean up his own brand, and so I figured it'd, it'd be a high time to get him on the podcast to talk about this. But uh, we digress because so you're, you're, you're doing this this climb. 200 miles at altitude, 9,000, 12,000 feet. We talked about some of the nu nutrition considerations. You're navigating via map and compass. So like you mentioned, it's only waypoint. So it's pretty serious, pretty rough. Black bears thrown into the mix as well. Uh, <laughs> talk to me about how you're training for this thing in terms yeah, of uh, not not the nutrition piece, which we kind of touched on, but more like the, the training or even, you know, if we want to go here, I know it annoys some people when I bring this up, but even like, you know, biohacks and things you're doing to speed up the process. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, uh, well, look at, um, I tend to be a bit insane about my training. I, and what I do, no one has to do this way. And, and I know you and I have some differences on, on, on training philosophy, but, you know, I just come from a background that uh, was unkind and brutal uh, as a swimmer. That's just the way it is. There's, there's nothing when you're trying to make uh, an NC2A team or an Olympic team, an Olympic trials event, uh, that's kind. There's nothing smiling about the sport of swimming. It's a hard sport. It's an unkind sport. And that's my background. That's what I'm used to. I'm used to being beat up. And um, so with that sort of background and one other backdrop here, I, I went on a hike several years ago. I got, I got really interested in this high altitude uh, training and hiking because my brother's a class five climber. He's been climbing as long as I've been swimming. And uh, I read Crack Hour's book, uh, Into Thin Air, and I was fascinated and and uh, really a bit surprised at the personality types that did that kind of climbing up Everest and back. I thought they were crazy and insane and uh, couldn't understand them at all because it, it it's one thing to, geez, I mean, 
tra- it's one thing to train for an event. It's another thing to want to get to the top of Everest. I, it, it's hard stuff and it takes months and it's very expensive. But after a while, I, I just got more and more intrigued and I called my brother and said, hey, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go up to Grand together. Why don't you take me up on your next hike? And mm-hmm. the, short, the short version of that story is, I don't think I've told you this story, um, but the very short version of that story is he said, oh, yeah, just show up. You don't need to train or anything. You know, you were once a world-class athlete. It'll be, I said to him, gee, that doesn't make sense. You know, I think you've you got to train for this stuff. You can't just show up and do it. And he kept assuring me everything would be fine. Well, the bottom line is it wasn't fine. I did listen to him. I didn't, I didn't follow my own good instincts and my own good judgment. And uh, I showed up and I just got the crap beat out of me by uh, by the mountain. I couldn't handle it. I knew 10, 10 steps in. And these are straight up mountains. They start with trails and then eventually they, they go a bit off trail and you're, you're in scree and you're in talus and granite boulders and big rocks and stuff like that. It gets hard. And uh, the bottom line is it just screwed me up bad. I was out of shape. I couldn't handle it. I had 50, 60 pounds on my back. And I never forgot that experience and you know, went back to training really, really hard for these events. So that so that's a backdrop to explain why I do it the way I do it now. No one needs to do it the way I do it. I'm a bit insane this way. But so I'll swim about because that's my background. And just for conditioning and lung work, I do about 3,000 yards a day in a master's program here. Um, in Texas, I train in Texas, which is hill country. It's not flat, mm. but it sure as heck is in California or where you live. You, you've got great mountains around you that can really, really get you trained for this sort of event. So I don't have that going on. I have to kind of find every way I can to 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 replicate the difficulty. So what I do is 3,000 yards a day, five days a week. I get into the gym three days a week, but with a trainer because I need to be pushed beyond my capability. I do not like to uh, in the pool, I can't my capability. No one can spot you. No one can push you. They can just yell at you. You know, and right. you can work as hard as you can do. But in the gym, I hire a trainer to push me beyond my capabilities, and there's a reason for that. I don't like it. I, there's nothing about it I like. I've just learned that the alternative is worse. So I'd rather I'd rather do the pain now and make the training inglorious, so that when I get to my event, it's a glorious event. And then lastly, um, uh, so I swim uh, hard uh, five days a week. Uh, I'll uh, get in the gym three days a week and train very, very hard. A lot of leg work, tons of leg work, deadlift squats, stuff like that. Uh, but then I have a training backpack, and I currently um, I'm walking uh, with about 70 pounds on my back, which is more than I'll carry. I'll go out into the back country with somewhere right around 30 pounds. And so I'll do on the weekend a 10 mile, 70 pound weighted hike in hill country. So in it, in it, and I can make it tough. It's even though it's not mountainous, I can make it very, very hard here. There are difficult uh, climbs here to do, uh, despite the fact they're only, you know, they're, they're only hills, but you can make it hard. Uh, and then during the week I'll do, you know, I'll shorten that up and I'll drop the weight down to about, um, you know, 50 pounds and do two, three mile uh, hikes. So three, three and 10 on the hikes, swimming and in the gym. And then I won't taper Mm. for this event. I'll train hard right up to the event because I'm going to be out there. It's going to take me about two to two and a half, let's just say two to three weeks to complete it. So I figure I'll let my body begin to taper and rest on the trail. So I'll, I'll go in tired. And that's what my training looks like. But I, again, I do it that way because that time, I I don't get that. Why, why would you, why would your body taper and rest when you're already out there, you know, at altitude beating yourself up? Well, it's true that it's going to be tough at altitude. I'm going to have uh, some oxygen issues up there. It's definitely going to be a lot of vertical and it's going to be put a lot of work on my body, but I know my body really well. And um, I've done this kind of training before for this specific type of event. When I went back to the Grand because I got spit off the mountain so hard and so embarrassingly that I went and did what I believed I knew best for my body and trained just the way I've described to you. And they end up being just glorious events. So uh, t- when I say taper, let me let me. It's a great question, by the way. You you put that really well. Let me just dial that in a little bit. And when I mean taper, what I mean is we when you back off that kind of work, fifteen thousand yards a week, um, ten, fifteen miles of very hard, heavy hiking, uh, and gym work, your body does go through some amount of rest. Now it's true you're gonna some of that is is. Uh, mitigated by the fact that you're now climbing straight up and down uh, up at altitude and dealing with oxygen issues. But the net result has historically been, boy, I love this question because you're making me really think hard about what's coming up here. Historically, 
um, that type of training does wonders for me. And the event ends up being, I can almost ultra run. That's a bit of an exaggeration. I can almost run, uh, the mountains when I train that way, but you, you've hit the nail on the head and I have to really, really think about this too, because this is the first time I'm going to be going into a situation where it's, where it's, where my work is not measured in miles. So I mentioned 10 miles and three miles and stuff like that. But it, on this particular, uh, walk, as they like to call it in the mountaineering community, um, it's all about the vertical, not the miles. So it's the miles will be dictated by how much vertical I can do on a daily basis. So if, and, and the degree of angle, right? The degree of incline. So all of that adds up to, at the end of the day, you look at your vertical and you see what the miles are, and that's how you begin to figure out what your average is going to be. So it's a whole new way of thinking about it. So I, that's a really, really good question and something that's new to me and took me a second to realize this is not like going up the grand like I used to do. This is a whole different ball of wax, even though the grand is basically straight up and straight down. Um, that's a three day event. This is yeah. the reason I asked you, you know, one, one of the best pieces of advice, I think Peter Reed, who won a whole bunch of Ironman triathlons back in the day, he gave me this advice when we were teaching a cycling camp together. He said, it's better to go into the race or the event 1%. How did he put it? Uh, oh yeah. 10% under trained versus 1% over trained. It's better to go in 10% under trained versus 1% over trained. That's time yeah, and time again. I've had my best events when I feel like, dude, I got sick two weeks ago going into the race and didn't get the training in. I wanted to get in. I got forced to rest because I was traveling too much. My kids had a bunch of stuff going on, so I couldn't work out going into this race. Couldn't do the stereotypical, you know, panic training and the race just turns out way better. Your legs are light as a feather and you're, you're totally tapered and, and super compensated. Yeah, my, I, I think that's a really good point. And also one I think is worth taking a minute, at least from my point of view, to talk about. So there's, I, I love that idea. When I think of 10% under trained, what that means to me or, or how I would think about it or approach that is come off, you know, come off training, begin a tapering process that's event specific so that you go in as, as you're pointing out somewhat rested. That's critical and I agree with that. And the term over training is a bit uh, of a, a bit of a misnomer. And so when I use the term over training, I sort of use it as a very loose term, meaning I train really hard, but I don't overtrain because overtraining is a really important – it's a technical word in in uh, in sports. And if you overtrain, you're exhausted. You can't get anything done. Tapering doesn't really work. You beat up, you're exhausted, and you don't have a good event if you if you overtrain. I've had friends do that. They've been kicked out of workout by the, the team physicians for – you know, three or four days to just rest and, and, and come back around. So there is such a thing as, I'll just call it for now, true overtraining, which is detrimental and no amount of tapering fixes that. You just have to rest and then come back to training. Uh, whereas what I do, which is to say tons of volume training, but I always know how to train inside, let's say the envelope so that I don't move to that point where like what you just described and what Reed just described doesn't happen to me. So in other words, because it's two weeks long, because it's not a day event. If it was a day event, I'd taper for this. I'd back off. Yeah. I'd start backing off two weeks out big time. I'd, I'd be backing off and I'd go in just like you described. Um, he, he calls it 10% undertrained. I'd prefer to think of it as, as tapered, which in a way is, you know, you've reduced training and you're not at your – it, the tricky thing about tapering is people don't understand is that you're not at your mid-season best or at your highest level of training. You can't lift as much. You can't maybe run as far when you're tapered. But what if again, if it's event specific, you're going to have like what you do, a world-class event, your best run, your best bike ride because you're lean, you're clean, everything is rested. The rest is critical and you're going to have the best event possible if you're tapered properly. So I would do that if it was a day or two event or even a three-day event. But because it's such a long event – I, I think I got to go in tired and just uh, 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 figure it out. I mean, so, so some of this is an experiment for me. I've, I've never done it this way before. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah. So, so there's zero trails. Does that mean you're, you're basically just bushwhacking? It's effectively zero. Let's just to be really, really clear. It's roughly 200 miles. Uh, it starts on a trail that's about, you know, I think five miles long. And then from that point, you go off trail. And about, if I remember correctly, about 30 miles of the 200 miles does go back on trail. It'll pick up the PCT, the Pacific Crest Trail, and the John Muir Trail, and a couple of obscure trails for just a minute here and there. Because on those spots on this particular route, the guy who invented this route way back in the 70s, um, those areas that end up going on trail are because the terrain is so rough, it's not recommended to go any further. So he found a way to circumvent 
um, what would end up being class five climbing, which I'm not interested at all in doing rope carabiner and rappelling and all that stuff. I, and I wouldn't do that alone anyway. Um, mm. so this is designed to be something that you can do for 200 miles and uh, w while difficult. I mean, some people – I think I sent you an article someone wrote calling it the, the hardest hike in America. You sent me um, that article, and I want to link to that. If, if folks go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash cleanup, it's a really great article on – Gizmodo written by this guy that that not only did it but kind of he spelled out a lot of the gear that he used as far as the GPS and the watches and uh, everything that he used to actually do the event some really good links to maps so I mean if you're listening in and, and you're heavy into hiking and you want to try something like this out uh, it's, it's a it's a great article so I'll link to that one in the show notes it's called the hardest hike in America Hey, I want to interrupt today's show to tell you how to get rid of gas and constipation. So there's this guy named Ken Brown. He's an incredibly impressive gastroenterologist, huge body knowledge. He lives in Texas, and he's been on my podcast before, and he's dedicated all of his research down there to finding a way to fix bloating and a lot of other digestive issues like IBS and IBD. So one of the things that he found that works really well is a stuff called quebracho, quebracho calorado. Uh, and what that does is it's a polyphenol-based blend that actually knocks out the ability for the bacteria in your gut to be able to create all that annoying gas that they produce. So you could get this amount of polyphenols from like three or four cups of blueberries, but that's a lot of blueberries, a lot of fructose, kind of expensive. So Atrantil gives you all those polyphenols in one single capsule. They're also NSF certified for sport, meaning people in the NCAA or the MLB or the NFL, or marathoners, triathletes, anybody who's competing in a sanctioned sport can take this stuff guilt-free. They've also put a bunch of other compounds in there that help to improve recovery from exercise size induced muscle damage and they've actually got some studies to back that up uh, they also show that it assists with muscle perfusion meaning blood flow to your muscles during exercise you're not just basically killing off the bad bacteria in your gut or limiting its ability to be able to, do, to produce gas uh, or even leaky gut uh, but it pushes these methane producing bacteria out of the small bowel and just stops the methane completely now this stuff you get a discount on you get a 15 percent discount on it very simple you go to lovemytummy.com slash ben that's lovemytummy.com slash ben use code ben at the checkout that'll get you 15 percent off so lovemytummy.com slash ben use code ben at the checkout for 15 percent off it's got a 100 percent money back guarantee so you can't go wrong anyways this podcast is also brought to you by True Niagen. You may have heard of NAD before. I recorded a, an anti-aging podcast on this molecule, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. It's called NAD. It helps your mitochondria create ATP, but you lose 50% of your NAD levels between the age of 40 and 60, and you start to lose a little bit of it before that. And when your NAD levels are low, your cells can't produce the energy they need to maintain your health as you age. Uh, the only supplement that's been clinically proven to raise NAD levels is known as nicotinamide riboside or NR and that is the key ingredient in this stuff called true niagen true niagen so when you take this stuff uh, the guy I interviewed about it who helped to develop it Charles Brenner he recommends a little bit in the morning a little bit in the afternoon to the evening because it follows this circadian rhythm variation. Uh, it supports muscle recovery. It increases energy since every cell in your body needs NAD, every single cell. Regulates your circadian rhythm, uh, which helps you to wake up and go to sleep uh, at the same time every day. And it restores your body's natural balance of NAD. They've actually done studies on this and found that it also has really good potential to improve blood pressure and to support cardiovascular health. And most folks just chronically supplement with this stuff all year long, just a couple capsules. So uh, you can get more information on how to get your hands on this NR, this true niagen. It's vegetarian, gluten-free, nut-free, caffeine-free. There's no animal byproducts. There's no artificial colors or flavors. You just go to trueniagen.com. That's T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N.com. Trueniagen.com. Check them out. Uh, anyways, though, so it, yeah, it is interesting what you say about the super compensation and, and the overreaching and then bouncing back or tapering, Craig. And I don't know if you track this stuff, but I've been using uh, the, the Aura Ring lately. And you could, yes, use, you yes. could use a heart rate yep. variability app. You could use body temperature tracking 
You can even use these pulse oximeters that track your oxygen. But the idea is that, for example, when I sit around for a few days going into a race and I only do some walks, a little bit of sauna, some swimming, you know, some easy elastic band work, stuff like that, I see my body temp during the night drop. I see my heart rate variability, especially during the night, because this thing takes five minute measurements all during the night. That goes up. I see my actual uh, heart rate uh, decrease, which goes along with with the body temperature decreasing. And then if you take your pulse oximetry, which is very easy to do, I've got a little pulse oximeter here on my desk. It climbs from 97 to 98 to 99. You know, as your body builds all these new red blood cells after it's no longer getting beat up, and they have a chance to, you know, in a sense catch up. It's actually very cool and very easy to, to see what happens when you taper the right way. And it's also interesting to see oh, yeah. what happens when you ignore it going low. You know, you can you can predict injury or illness yep. pretty accurately. So yeah, it's 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 kind of cool what happens to the body and also cool that we live in a day and age where you can track it pretty intensively. So do you use any of these these self quantification devices by the way? You know, you're you're busting me and you're outing me here. I don't, and I need to. And I, I you know, I, I'm starting to move into some of this other technology. I guess a lot of what I do is, um, it's just sort of been the way I've done it. Doesn't make it right, and it's not complete. But I, I need to do that stuff. So that's a that's a great piece of advice. Yeah. Well, what you have been doing is you've been you've been uh, cleaning up your supplements. I want I want to talk about this. So you've got all these yeah. formulas, and and you wrote to me until you 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 kind of optimized the formulas, and and you kept the same amount of ingredients because you have your your oxia, which is the one that buffers lactic acid and increases oxygen delivery, and then the the other ones, the chlorella for the immune system and the the red blood cell production, and then also your, your AFA, which also has the the liver in it, which is great for again red blood cells blood flow, hormones, and the immune system. Uh, but these were originally tablets. I actually used to chew them. Like, like you would send me <laughs> these bottles, and I'd just throw them in my mouth and chew them like a meal. Tell me about why you switched to capsules, which is what I, for example, I, I broke open and put into my smoothie this morning. Yeah. Um, all right. Another great question here. Um, there are two reasons for this, and it really began a couple of years ago when I got some feedback from some of the ladies saying, gee, Craig, it's it's a big tablet. You know, is there any way you can cut it back? And I said, gee, I, you know, I, I've got to do that research and figure it out and see if there's a way to do that. That makes sense. Um, and then I got some feedback from some other customers that said, you know, this stuff really works. I have two, um, they're not sponsored, but they're, they're two, um, professionally sponsored athletes that used to, like you that use the products and have done the blood test, the blood work on it. And they're very serious or no nonsense. They don't say what isn't so, at least for them. Again, I always speak in terms of one's own individual experiences. What's true for me may not be true for you and, and so on. So I like to be really transparent about all this. So speaking certainly for myself and them, and maybe to some degree for you too, they, they did the blood work. They have to do the blood work and they're tested by these governing bodies all the time. And they're getting phenomenal uptake and they were getting the the same result I get, which I do get a bump in red blood cell production. I do get when I do the, the, my chlorella formula with the echinacea. When I'm disciplined about it, I get colds way less often. So I knew that uh, the formula is really good, and I didn't want to do anything to impact, impact that. Um, so I talked to uh, my manufacturer and said, look, how much of what's in my formula is, is uh, binders that hold it all together? And by the way, a lot of people of those people too, I would say what you do. I say, look, blend it up in a blender or crush it up into a drink and or eat it. And it, it wasn't a bad tasting at all. You could taste most of the ingredients, not not the binders. Um, but I had a few people say, gee, I just prefer not to have that stuff in there. So I looked up all of these ingredients and I suppose there's some you know, discussion on the kinds of things that bind my ingredients together or ingredients in general and in, in many, many supplements which have the ingredients I take Yeah, like out, magnesium but, stearate and sodium yeah, selenate yeah. and titanium yeah. dioxide and all this stuff. Yeah, very common. And I thought, well, what if I could get a cleaner uptake? Uh, uh, so anyway, I talked to my uh, I talked to my manufacturer and said, how much of the formula is actually uh, to get that one milligram pill to, is actual binder? And it was 40% of it. And I said, hell, get rid of it, clean it up. People, do, people would like not to have it. Many, many people have wished not to have it. And so I said, just take it out and let's move to a capsule and purify it. So now, uh, when you take it, you're just getting pure, clean ingredient. There's no, as I call it, my own term, competitive uptake. So in other words, the calcium car carbonate, the dicalcium phosphate, these are the things that were taken out. Microcrystalline cellulose, steric acid. Uh, here's one I'm not all that familiar with, 
prosomellos sodium, whatever that is, silicon dioxide and pharmaceutical glaze, all gone. So there's just no reason. It's not stuff that's going to hurt you, but there's no reason to have it in there. And I'd rather create a product that's cleaner and more optimized and has better uptake um, and gives yeah. you a, a better hit. And it's that's exactly the- the, the sodium cross carmelis, that, that's an emulsifier. It's used ah, to make gotcha. the ingredients kind of mix together a little bit better. And, and emulsifiers are pretty common in, in a lot of these supplements. But, yeah, ultimately, the, the more you can take out, the better. But I want to take a little bit more of, of kind of a deep dive into a few of these ingredients. Like um, dicalcium phosphate. So that bulks out tablets. I know it's not very well absorbed or used by the body. It's like this cheap, inorganic form of calcium. And a lot of people see calcium and they just assume that calcium is in there, so it must be good for you. But but it's inorganic. It's inexpensive, and your body doesn't actually absorb it. So if anything, one thing I've noticed that that tends to cause in people when they eat a lot of this in their supplements is constipation. Like the, cal- the high levels of the calcium carbonate and dicalcium phosphate, you know, you, you don't have to worry too much, in my opinion, about like excessive calcification in the bloodstream and arterial calcification, things like that, because a lot of it doesn't get absorbed at all. It just kind of sticks around the gut. But that's where you get the issues with constipation. So... That's, that's one reason I was kind of happy to see the calcium carbonate and dicalcium phosphate was taken out of there. And what about the cellulose? You know, a lot of people just say the cellulose is basically a, you know, microcrystalline cellulose. It's a, it's a fiber. Did you just take that out to have a smaller capsule or what was your reasoning behind the cellulose piece? Well, I took it all, all of it out for two reasons. A, to get a, so yes, you, you heard what I said in the beginning there. Some of the people didn't like the size of it. So it got me and it's not that much smaller, interestingly, but uh, got a smaller capsule, and it just it just made sense to me that if I could get a hundred percent pure ingredient here and get a slightly better hit or any better hit at all from just having pure ingredient in there, then it meant everything should have to go. And that was the thinking behind uh, all of it: the, mm. the microcrystal and cellulose and everything. It's just yeah. none of this stuff is necessarily bad for you or or bad for you at all. But w- why not just get the purest, cleanest, cleanest hit you can possibly get? Um, and again, speaking for myself, the change, I feel uh, a slightly better hit. I can't say that I get a, a massive hit, but I do get a change. I, I do get a better hit. And some of the sponsored racers that did the blood work get a better hit. So I, and that's why I Be- use What do you mean better hit? A stronger effect from it. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Get a stronger effect from it. Okay, yeah, the uh, cellulose is is totally indigestible. That, that's what I wasn't too concerned about. That you know, I don't I don't get too concerned about. You know, usually it's called cellulose or microcrystalline cellulose on capsules. So that one I'm not as concerned about as the uh, as the calcium. But then you also took out titanium dioxide, and that's interesting because uh, they've actually shown titanium dioxide to be a potential carcinogen, and it's in a ton of supplements. You know, in, in rodent studies, it's there's a direct link between titanium dioxide and respiratory tract cancer, but it's used in freaking toothpaste, it's used in supplements, it's used in pharmaceutical compounds. And again, like if you're taking, I know a lot of listeners do this, you know, they're taking like 10, 15 different supplements, you're looking at a lot of titanium dioxide. Yeah, it's it's just better to, I think, my own opinion, I just think it's better to get as clean as you can. And that's the whole idea behind optimization. Um, just making this a pure ingredient formula. I and mean, the only thing in there that that is uh, that's not a pure ingredient would just be now we have a, a gelatin capsule. And at some point here, we'll we'll get a vegan option here too. Uh, but what I say to oh, vegans, because uh, the gelatin is derived from animals. Right, right. So what I okay. t- tell people. So in if but we do in effect have a vegan formula too in this regard. Just. Do what you did with the capsules. Just crush it up, or open up the capsules and and pour it into your water, pour it in your drink. And oh, I didn't even the, think uh, about that. So, it. so when I do that, I'm not actually I'm not actually getting uh, getting the gelatin. Yeah, so, I, so technically, I could do. Well, I'm using bone broth anyway, so it doesn't matter. But if I if I were vegan or vegetarian, you could literally just open it up and ditch the capsule. But do you have you formulated these to you know to take into consideration like the acidic environment of the stomach are they is it necessary for it to be a time release capsule or something like that for people who break open capsules that's uh, it's another really good question i i haven't given that thought um because uh, you know as i was creating this stuff and and uh, how it worked on me didn't dictate that i had to think in those terms but that's something that's something worth putting some thought into but no that did go into this mm-hmm. because for me historically when i take the stuff uh, i get the hit i want when i want it which is usually 
within 20 or 30 minutes of taking it. Uh, and I never thought of it in terms of uh, uh, a time-released formula that would last throughout the day. Because in my – remember, I come from a sprint background. So I want to get the best hit I can you know, just ahead of my event. So uh, whether it's uh, training for two hours or hiking, you know, I have to do it every day when I'm hiking several times a day. Um, but that's how I looked at it. I never looked at it in terms of a time-released yeah, I know. Uh, I know for for probiotics, that's important. For probiotics, it, breaking them open and dumping them, you know, a lot of times they're they're not going to survive the acidic nature of the stomach. And there there are there are a few others that are like that. Usually, they're like some type of gut compound or gut formula that you want to wind up in the small intestine or the large intestine a little bit more intact. But in most cases, it's it's uh, it's it's a moot point to break it open, you know, unless again it's like a probiotic or, or a gut type of support compound. Another one that was in there was magnesium stearate. Magnesium stearate. Now that, that one we see a lot in as well as a, as a binder, you know, in nutraceutical and pharmaceutical products. And you know the the uh, the research I've seen on that one kind of goes back and forth. The only right. the only compelling study I've seen was like a slight suppression of immune function, and it can cause a little bit of gastric distress in in some people, especially again if they're doing a lot of magnesium, meaning they're taking a lot of supplements. Because you know if you're taking a handful. Heck, I know some anti-aging enthusiasts who are taking like 70 to 80 capsules a day of a wide variety of things. Then you're talking about literally like tablespoons of magnesium stearate if you're going that route. And in my opinion, you know, you get to the point where you do really want to take into consideration at that point, you know, the 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 amount of magnesium stearate or even the amount of, you know, calcium carbonate or dicalcium phosphate that you're consuming. So for that, I think it just kind of depends on on how much. They actually I think that's a really good point too. That, along with the, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the calcium co- uh, carbonate and dicalcium phosphate, I think were the pro- the, the uh, antagonists. Uh, and, and some people, very very few, but very few people would would say, "Gee, you know, I, I love the product, Craig, but I'm having." a little bit of a digestive issue with it. And it took me some time to figure out that those were likely the culprits. And so gone, you know, they're just gone. And again, yeah. it just made more sense to create a product that's just clean and natural all the way through that delivers pure energy and just, just rid myself of all of these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's a much better, it's a much better product today than it was yesterday. Silica was one of the last ones that was in there that I know you took out. And that, that's another one I don't worry about too much. Actually, silica is one that, that can – some people will take that as a supplement for bone and collagen formation and skin and nail health. And, and you know typically, it's on the label silica or silicone dioxide compared to some of the, some of the calcium diphosphates and calcium ingredients and – you know, some of these other things like uh, you know, that, that can cause some gut distress, like high levels of magnesium stearate. Silicone is not one that I worry about too much. You know, and, and, you know, I, what, what I like, though, is that it's, it's just a super clean capsule now when I look at the right. label. So in terms of what's actually in there, are there, are there any excipients or fillers or, or anything like that? And if so, how do you, how do you even pull that off? Like, like why, would, why would somebody even put extra ingredients into a gelatin capsule if they weren't necessary? Like, are there disadvantages to taking all this stuff out? I, no, no, not at all. There's only, as I understand it and see it, research it talked about it, but I mean, I did this for a long time before I made the move. Um, I, how, from my point of view, how about zero disadvantage and how about a hundred percent advantage? Because again, you're just getting clean, pure ingredient. Now that's the only thing your, your digestive tract is, is working on uptaking instead of, uh, working any of this other, uh, filler ingredients. So no, uh, it's, it's all upside. As far as I know, I, I always defer to your expertise and people of your, your level, your, your way up the curve on the science side of this stuff. But well, I mean, no, like, I, like no well, when, when I went to Thorne and I toured their facilities, they told me that, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, some of these anti-caking agents, for example, those are added to stop the ingredients from clogging up the machines. I mean, are you are you destroying factories with these things now, or do, or do people not care about that? <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, I'm not destroying machines, and factories are surviving me. So no, I, we're, we're not having any difficulty with that at all. Um, it, it's it's not, and and plus the product is meant to be used. Uh, it's not. I mean, it can sit on the shelf for as long as the lot numbers in, or I think it's good for two years uh, under these current conditions. Where I think the tablets might have been good for longer, but I just preferred. To have people using the product, taking it when they need it, and anyone who's sitting it on the shelf for over a year probably isn't going to be using it anyway. So, no, we're not breaking machines, and factories are surviving me, and it's holding together just fine. And maybe just a shorter shelf life is a result of it. But yeah, I was going to say a lot of these things are preservatives, and they do allow for a little bit better, 
Yeah, uh, not not only the the ability of the ingredients to stick together or to make swallowing easier, that type of thing, or, or to maintain powder consistency, but it's to save ingredients from spoiling. And what you're saying is you may have shortened the life of your ingredients a little bit. Yeah, and the trade off again is a cleaner, purer ingredient with 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 a better hit, as I as I see it and believe and have felt it. Um, and as I say, if something's going to be sitting on a shelf for five years, you're probably not you know probably not training anymore. You're not doing much of anything. So I feel like it was a minor trade off to get a better product that that a, a few years uh, on the shelf as opposed to five years on the shelf. So how much of this stuff are you taking going into this this hardest hike in America that you're doing? So I'm I'm trying to you know you've look at you've been a big inspiration to me part of the part of the reason I'm doing this is because uh, you know you're out there doing big stuff and I said gee Ben's an inspiration I I need to do something big here but I've also I've always wanted to hike these uh, long haul hikes anyway like the eighteen I don't know man Pacific. I'm doing like hour long Spartan races you're going on a on a multi no, how no, many, how many you're, days you're, is this thing gonna take. Don't 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 dismiss that. I'm not buying that. Neither is the audience. You're a bad boy, and we all know it. This is about a two week event. Two to Jeez. it depends on how many miles I can do I again. Done anything and like again, that. well, uh, look at yeah, maybe not like this, but uh, I think things are mostly relative. So the stuff you're doing, I can't do. I couldn't I couldn't train for a Spartan event and get through that stuff. It would blow me away. That's tough. It's what you're doing is hard stuff. You have my my uh, admiration here. I I don't know I don't know how you do it. This is not quite like what you do, I think. Um, I'm not saying the training isn't hard. I'm not saying it's not a difficult event. And I'm not saying that doing 7,000 or 5,000 vertical feet a day is easy. It's, it, it isn't. But I think what you do is harder. I honestly, honest to God, think what you do is harder. So mm -hmm. the way I'm training for it, I'm trying to and, – and so the other inspiration I've gotten from you, I – uh, maybe I was an accidental hacker way back in the day when I was constructing this stuff. I didn't think of it that way. I was just trying to selfishly find something that would give me a competitive edge. Um, and so this, these compilations came together and for me, they worked. And so today things are a little different. You know, I got you out there hacking away and, uh, you, you know, you're a creme de la creme group doing the same thing. And I thought, well, um, I'm going to be up here between nine and 12,000 feet. Uh, AFA has the heavy iron content in it. And iron is a precursor. It's a huge, important ingredient for red blood cell production and energy. And that's the AFA product. So the way I'm looking at this is really the way I recommend most athletes do it coincidentally. But I'll switch it up when I get out there, which is um, I'll probably take three of these things, the AFA, uh, uh, right, right out of the gate in the morning when I start to hit the trail, probably somewhere – Let's say that's six, seven in the morning. Somewhere around 10 or 11, I'll, I'll drop oxia to get some more vasodilation and some oxy better oxygen delivery. And later in the day, I'll do the chlorella. That's been my routine. That's worked for my chemistry really, really well. I may switch that around up there and uh, see what happens. I may start off with oxia to get the immediate vasodilation, to get the, the bigger uh, uh, blood flow and the bigger mm -hmm. oxygen delivery right out of the gate. But I really want to take advantage of the uh, the the uh, AFA uh, product also because of the iron in it, the desiccated liver in it, and also because of the AFA's properties for um, uh, repair, for yeah. muscle repair. So, yeah. yeah, I'm going to be in an environment that's brutal and hard and tough. And um, I'm going to need a lot AFA of being the, the aquafluous algae. Yes, I'm correct. That right? yes. Aquafluous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, back, back to training for a second. Uh, when, when you're strapping on this 70 pound backpack and you're going out and doing your rucking, you know, for, for me, especially when I was training for events like the ultra beast world championships for Spartan and Tahoe <laughs> and some of these events where you're climbing for a long period of time, I didn't want to damage my knees from doing the downhill component, right? right Cause right, what goes right. up must come down unless you got a helicopter yeah. or a car at the top to pick you up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I would use this, this Nordic track, uh, incline yeah. training. It goes up to like a 40% incline. Are you using anything like a Steramel or an incline trainer or, um, actually another one, uh, you know, who swears by this is LeBron James. He has this, a whole bunch of folks in Hollywood use it now to get super fast results, you know, training to, to put on muscle or lose fat pretty quickly. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think that in, in all of his different houses across the country, LeBron James has one of these and, uh, it's the Versa climber. I know a lot of climbers use oh, yeah. this as well. Uh, do you, uh, do you use the Versa climber or an incline trainer or anything like that? Man, I've used that stuff so much in the past, and um, I'll come back to a, a phrase I've been using a little bit in this conversation here, which is event-specific. So the answer is no, and the reason is that uh, it's really phenomenal training. The problem is, in both cases, it's straight-ahead training, meaning that if you're on a treadmill and you're eating no matter what the angle is, no matter how hard you make it, you're walking a straight line. 
and uh, there's no variation in the ground there. And it's the same thing with the Versa Climber. I recommend them both uh, for, for adjunct training or ancillary training, cardio training, you know, uh, conditioning training. But you have to get out there when you're going into this kind of environment where the ground is unstable, meaning there are boulders, there's granite there. There's granite, you know, huge, giant granite slabs and talus, and the ground is moving and rock formations everywhere. It's, uh, as I say, it's only about 30 miles of actual trail. The rest is... Um, uh, is, is all like I've just described. So I got to get out there and I've got to find places that can get as close to replicating the real thing, which is, you know, the weight, mm-hmm. you don't, you don't have to go as heavy as I go. I do think when you're doing what, what I'm doing here, you should be training at the, at a minimum up to the weight you're carrying. I just like to go in, you know, I like to train hard and heavy and go in light, but, uh, no, so no, I think those are great, great ways to train, but I think it's a mistake if you're doing a trail, I think that's fine. I think there's nothing wrong with doing a trail where, you know, it's mostly dirt. There's still going to be some unstable terrain there, but mostly dirt and well-trodden and hammered down. I think that Versa Climb is phenomenal, hard, hard training. Um, that's a t- I try to avoid the Versa Climber, to tell you the truth. I was there when it came out, and it frightened me then, and it frightens me today, and I sort of look at it as some sort of yeah. monolith. It's, you know, it's, it's good, man. It came out in, oh, uh, came out in 1981, the year I was born, yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough, tough, uh, tough machine. So I go, out, I go out with weight and try to replicate groundwork. So my ankles roll and turn, and I go through all of that stuff. Yeah. You know what? I, I kind of agree with you, but at the same time, because, because you know, I, I I found that my ankles were pretty able to handle a lot of the downhill and the the undulating and unpredictable terrain when I went out and did a lot of the races, especially during the year I was using that Nordic Track incline trainer a lot. Uh, I would actually use, and this sounds dumb. I don't want to be one of those guys who just like got a bunch of stuff in my basement, and never gets up into the mountains. But these uh, these balance boards, and you know, I, I have oh, like a fluid stance yeah. trainer here at my desk yeah. that I'll stand on while I'm working. And there's there's another one. Uh, I do the, that. The, the Bosu obviously is another one you you can stand on when you're weight bearing. Uh, and then I do a lot of single leg training, you know, single leg squats. When I'm in the sauna doing my heat training, I interviewed this gal named Belissa Vranich, and we talked about was it Belissa? No, it was Emily Splachow. Uh, we talked about her book Barefoot Strong, and she has all these exercises to strengthen your ankles and the supporting yeah. musculature for your ankles while you're just like you know, brushing your teeth or in the sauna. And, and I'll link if you guys go to bengreenfieldfitness.com/slash cleanup. I'll link to my interview with her. But dude, I mean, like you know, I, I know it sounds like a like a silly little biohacker who doesn't want to go outside and and run downhill through the rocks, but especially if your time is limited or you're stuck indoors, you know, you're working at, at an office. I think that one-two combo of doing something like the incline trainer with a balance board or a balance device can can get you decently strong as far as that ankle health is concerned. I totally agree, especially – oh, I agree with all of that, uh, first of all. I just yeah, I just sort of have a, a preference of, uh, of trying to emulate what it is I'll be doing, where I'm going in my training. So that's the only reason why – plus the fact of the matter is the Versa Climber scares the shit out of me. So that's just being honest with you. But, but that balance work you're talking about is – phenomenal and it's not crazy at all that really does ha- i have weak ankles so everyone says yeah you got to go out with trail running shoes or or special hiking shoes that free up your ankles so you can move and i say gee you know you don't know me and uh you're wrong about that in my case i have to have at a minimum mid ankle support because i roll and the exercise you just described is perfect for that it's just perfect whether you're brushing your teeth or doing it at your desk like you are in the gym for strengthening ankles, and not only not only are you strengthening your ankles, but you're getting great balance work. And I deal with a lot of balance problems out there, not not internally. Just you're in a, an environment that checks your balance all the time. So uh, the balance board work or the ball work, you know, uh, really really phenomenal for getting your balance in line and also strengthening your ankle. Couldn't endorse that move, yeah. really for any for any sport. I think that's great for any sport. Yeah, yeah. The other thing to that I should harp upon with this ankle issue because I played college tennis and just brutally destroyed my ankles between that and high school basketball. Like I had sprained ankles all the time growing up, and I overuse this this one muscle related to the ankles. Now, whenever I get a massage, I have my massage therapist work on this because it gets super duper tight. Because this this particular muscle, I'll tell you about it, overworks to protect the ankles, and when it overworks, it gets tight, it gets adhesed, and that actually affects your knee mobility. So I get knee pain if I don't have a massage therapist work on this area, and it's difficult to hit yourself deep enough with it, you know, a foam roller or, or anything else. It's your uh, your peroneal 
your peroneal tendon that travels peroneal up and tendon. down. Yeah, that the outside of the leg, it kind of runs down the lower leg bone, the, the fibula, and kind of behind that bony lump on the outside of your ankle. That is your, the part that I roll. Lateral That's malleolus. Roll. Yeah, dude, you get deep tissue work done on that if you have ankle issues, helps tremendously. Like whenever I get that area worked on, it's one of the <clears> tightest, <throat> most teeth grittingly tight areas on my body. <laughs> but anybody who spends a lot of time on their feet, I'm telling you, like like ask your massage therapist or, or look up like a picture of the peroneal tendon. And if you can, you can you can try to hit it with like a golf ball or a type of thing. But man, that that area for people with ankle issues is is golden once you figure out how to increase mobility in the peroneal hey, tendon. It's totally true. But another thing I want to you know now now that I'm giving it a little more thought here about you're talking about downhill and knees and stuff like that. Another reason why I go out there and try to replicate the real thing is in the climbing you know community up to class four it's really 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 hard to replicate going downhill the way you just described the effect on your knees the effect on the quads hamstrings glutes totally changes when you're going downhill versus uphill so i'm really good uphill and i'm not as good downhill and it's really really hard to train for that in the gym on a versa climb or on a trip even on a an inverse uh, incline treadmill you really need to do a lot of downhill work and build up to that so that you can strengthen your knees for that particular movement and uh, get used to the rear part of your body uh, doing the work as opposed to the front part of your body, you know, hams, ham, hams and glutes and, and gastrocs as opposed to quads. Yeah. Uh, so that's another reason why event for this, again, specifically for, you know, a lot of vertical up and down, 7,000 up, 7,000 uh, it's, it's it, You got to do something that gets you into a scene where you're walking downhill with weight on your back. And, mm -hmm. and just further to that point. I think of training in the backcountry the same way I think of training in the gym. It's going to be in variable sets and I'm moving up. So I might start very, very light just to warm up and, and loosen up and just go through a series of uh, increasing weights using gym as an analogy here to, to the backcountry. So I met a guy yesterday who's going out in seven weeks to, to the same area but not the same hike and he's breaking into shoes with seven weeks to go with no no weight on his back at all. I said, dude, you're you're behind the curve, bud. Jeez. You need to get some Yeah, exactly. Jesus. I was, I was sort of shocked. I said, you gotta you gotta get some weight on your back here. You gotta get ten pounds in this week. So this is an example of what I tell people. Just just do ten pounds this week. You have seven weeks to go, which is not a lot, but then next week do twenty, then the next week do thirty. By the time you get to forty, it's a big jump, but you should be able to handle it. But steadily going up in weight over long i've been training for four months now for this so i'm i'm, I'm ready to go now I, I wish i could just get up and go now but my permits don't let me into uh the high country until uh, till august so i can't go till august i'll be going in august 7th and hopefully coming out sometime around august 23rd right in the wrong august there, 7th like to that. august 23rd can people track this at all you run in like an instagram account or anything like that yeah, yeah, good, good question. Thanks for bringing it up. I'm gonna bring in, I'm bringing in just in case because it is re very remote and I'm going solo terrain. Um, bringing a Delorme tracker in with me, so I, I'll put that. I'll send it to you uh, uh, so you can have it and uh, people can log in and they can see where I'm at and what the trail looks like. And if they're curious about it, they can have a laugh at how long it's taken me to get done what I thought would be done much quicker. How about that? Okay, so, cool. Yeah. So, so yeah, send that yeah. over to me and I'll put a link in, in the show notes. Uh, which are going to be at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash cleanup if any of you guys want to track Craig. And then also, I'll put a link to the previous episodes that I did with Craig over there and, and some of the other stuff we talked about in today's show, uh, like yeah, everything from from my, my breakfast smoothie slash bone broth <laughs> thing that I made this morning to uh, the Biotropic website. I know we can get 20% off of all Craig supplements. Use code BEN. Uh, the AFA is like... Craig mentioned uh, the, the floss aqui algae, beetroot powder, cordyceps, and liver anhydra. If you don't like liver, you can just take his capsules every day. I'd, I take them every day, so I don't, I don't have to worry that much about doing my serving of liver every week. And then uh, chlorella, beetroot powder, cordyceps, and echinacea is in his second one, the one that's called chlorella. And then the last one's called oxia, and that one's malic acid and citrulline for uh, buffering lactic acid, kind of staving off the burn. That's another one that works really well anytime you need to get your pump on or get the blood flowing. So any of those three, uh, if you guys are listening, you can get, you can get a discount uh, with code Ben. I'll put a link in the show notes to Craig's website for all that stuff. And uh, then you can also go over there and, and track Craig. Uh, Craig, as usual, dude, it's, it's, it's always interesting to talk to you and, and pick your brain about your, what you're up to, man. Well, 
It's it's always my pleasure. I love talking to you. You're a sharp dude. It's and I always learn something talking to you. So thanks for taking the time, man. It's been a blast. It's always a blast. Awesome. Thanks. And and uh, by the way, if I if I sounded uh, mildly uh, distracted during this interview, I, I yeah, wasn't, tell I wasn't, wasn't Let distracted, know. but but tell my uh, my so I I just got back last night from uh, from. Uh, uh, where the heck was I? It was uh, you were probably boy, on top boy, of some mountains. Boy, Boise, Idaho. Sometimes I forget where I was, and I was racing the Spartan down there. My hotel I stayed at this this I'm gonna shove them under the bus. The Grove Hotel in Boise. Uh, I I got covered in bed bug bites, and I woke wow. up this morning and my elbow is swollen like the size of a baseball from all this venom that's in my elbow. Like I've got these these little bites. I, I smeared myself in myrrh and frankincense essential oil last night to kind of draw some of it out. But dude, like right now, like while we're talking, my right arm, like even my fingers are throbbing from this elbow all swollen up. So if anybody's listening in and you've got tips for for me to suck out the venom from a bed bug bite, uh, or you can pull any sway with the Grove Hotel and tell them to clean up their beds. I'm 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 all ears. This thing's <laughs> bane in my side right now. I'm gonna have to have to have to fix this thing up. You don't have any supplements for that, dude, do you? <laughs> give me, give me a, give me a few weeks, and I'll get right. you hooked up. I'll, I'll come up with something. Somebody but needs also, that. That that's sell, that's sell that. like 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 hotcakes, bed bug, <laughs> bed bug supplement. Someone's got to come up with it. Why not me? Yeah. But also, you're you're being humble. He's what he's what what he's also not telling y'all is that he's going to be on the cover of uh, Outdoor Magazine uh, in in the coming months and doing think an it, interview think there. It's so. called, I think it's called Outside Magazine. Yeah. Outside Magazine, yeah. pardon me. Outside <laughs> Magazine. So, hey, yeah. easy slip. But anyway, it's yeah. a big thing, and that's really cool. I'm looking forward to reading yeah, that article. I'm actually rushing off to an interview with them right after this. Okay. So, All right. so well, again, well, folks, I, go to go to bengreenfoldfitness.com slash cleanup. Uh, that's where I'll have all the show notes. Thanks for listening in. And until next time, I'm Ben Greenfield and Biotropics Labs CEO, founder, crazy mad scientist, inventor, Craig <laughs> Dinkle, signing out from bengreenfoldfitness.com. Uh, always fun. Thanks a lot. See y'all. Bye-bye. Have an amazing week. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice.